This is Radio 4 of the BBC. Welcome again to Storytime. We now present Part 5 of Journey to the Center of the Earth. Jeffrey Banks, as Professor von Hardwig in A Journey to the Center of the Earth, the novel by Jules Verne, adapted for radio in eight parts by Howard Jones. Part five, The Battle of the Monsters. If you have followed my story to this point, you will recall that my name is Harry Lawson and that my uncle is the celebrated German scientist, Professor von Hardwig. I have told you how we chanced upon a fragment of ancient parchment bearing some mysterious runic writing and how this led us to follow in the footsteps of a 16th-century alchemist named Arne Saknesem into the crater of an extinct volcano in Iceland called Snæfoss, and so on a perilous journey to the center of the Earth. Perilous, did I say? Well, judge for yourself. At the outset, we all but died of thirst. Then, for four days, I was lost in the darkness of those subterranean passages a hundred miles beneath the surface of the Earth and driven to the verge of madness. My uncle cared nothing for such dangers as these. He is an eccentric, impetuous, wonderfully courageous man. As for Hans Bielke, our devoted guide and companion, well, he went calmly, without argument or complaint, wherever my uncle asked him to go. That was part of his agreement. While I was recovering from the injuries I suffered when I was lost, my uncle discovered a great subterranean sea, illuminated as if by daylight, by some natural form of electricity. He called it the Central Sea. We explored its shores for a short distance and came upon gigantic grasses, ferns as tall as pine trees, and a forest of mushrooms 40 feet high. Presently, when my uncle spoke of embarking on a sea voyage, I thought he was joking. My dear Harry, if you were to listen instead of talking quite so much, you would hear. Yes? What would I hear? Listen. That's Hans. Hans! I say, Hans! Hans, what are you doing? You speak, Master Harry. What are you making? You like this? What are you making? A raft, Master Harry. A raft, that's what it is. For some moments, I was struck dumb with astonishment and awe. The half-finished raft was made from lengths of a very peculiar wood, and a great number of joints, boughs, and pieces were scattered on the sandy shore. My uncle, who had followed me, beamed with satisfaction. What you see, my boy, is fossil wood. Here is pine. Here is a species of palm of the northern region, all mineralized by the action of the sea. Then it must be as hard and as heavy as iron. It certainly won't float, Uncle. <laughs> Indeed. Well, there's no proof like the proof of demonstration. I will throw a piece into the sea. There. <laughs> you are convinced? The fossil wood floated. It was incredible, but it floated. Not for the first time was it borne in on me that my journey to the center of the earth was changing all my preconceived notions. Truly, it would not have astonished me to have seen a fleet of native canoes afloat on that vast gray sea. The very next evening, the raft was finished. It was about ten feet long by five feet wide, and the beams, bound together by stout ropes, were firm and solid. It took the united efforts of the three of us to launch it, but once launched, it floated tranquilly and evenly. The professor was delighted. <laughs> Splendid. Splendid, my good hands. Now we have a means of locomotion other than our legs. Rapid and untiring. Tomorrow, we go forward. We go forward. On the next day, the 13th of August, we rose early. Hans had fashioned a mast from two lengths of wood skillfully joined together and a yard arm from another piece of wood. The sail was a linen sheet and we had no lack of cordage. I was forced to admit that our raft and equipment looked solid and seaworthy. At six o'clock in the morning, when the eager and enthusiastic professor gave the order to make ready, we carefully stowed on the raft all our food, luggage, instruments, weapons and a good supply of sweet water which we had collected from, from springs in the rocks. 
Hans had ingeniously contrived a rudder which enabled him to steer the raft with ease. He took the tiller as a matter of course, and he soon proved himself as good a sailor as he was a guide. At a word from my uncle, I untied the painter. The sail was brought to the wind, and we moved swiftly seaward. Thus were our travels at last resumed. Once more, we were setting out into the unknown. Just as we were leaving the little port where Hans had built the raft, my uncle, who was always very keen on naming newly discovered places, turned to Hans. What shall we call this place, Hans? Uh, our stream, the Hansbach, was named after you. This sea I have called the Central Sea. But this place, where we have embarked on our famous and historical voyage, we call after Master Harry. Splendid. Then we shall name it Port Harry. Port Harry. Yes, this is good. Very good. How do you like it, my boy? Well, before you quite make up your mind, Uncle, I have another name to propose. So? What other name? Come out with it. Gretchen. Gretchen? My goddaughter's name? Yes, Uncle. Have you forgotten I'm going to marry her? Oh, dear me. Yes, I, I believe that is the arrangement. Port Gretchen will sound very well on our future map. Port Gretchen? This is good. Very good. Very well. Port Gretchen, let it be. Farewell, Port Gretchen. We left the shore with the wind blowing from the northward and eastward. We sped before it splendidly, and it seemed to me that the winds at that depth, a hundred miles down, were much more powerful than winds at the surface. Such speed, such speed. If we continue at this rate, we shall cover at least 30 leagues in the next 24 hours. Already the northern shore was fading away on the edge of the horizon. To east and west, the shores separated more and more, leaving the open sea before us. Soon, I could see nothing ahead but the apparently limitless ocean. Huge dark clouds cast their grey shadows below, shadows which seemed almost to crush the water by their very weight. Silvery rays of light reflected here and there on odd patches of the sea brought out a luminous sparkle in the wake of the raft. Presently, we were wholly out of sight of land. Nothing could be seen save the sea around us. Without any distant point to focus my eyes upon, I could have fancied that we were motionless, except for the phosphorescent sparkle in our wake. About noon, we ran into a mass of seaweed. Never were seaweeds so gigantic or so wonderful as those of the Central Sea. We swept past specimens three to four thousand feet long, looking like snakes, stretching out far beyond the horizon. At last, night came, so the chronometer told us. But the luminous atmosphere was in no way dimmed. And whatever its true nature and cause, we realized that it was a phenomenon on which we could rely with absolute certainty. As soon as we had eaten our supper, I stretched myself at the foot of the mast and presently fell asleep. Hans remained motionless at the tiller. The wind being aft and the sail square, we ran steadily on. Almost as soon as we left Port Gretchen, my uncle had instructed me to keep a regular log of our daily navigation with all the most minute particulars. Wind direction, weather conditions, speed, distance covered, in a word, every detail and incident of this extraordinary voyage. From this log, therefore, I can tell the story of our adventures on the Central Sea. Friday, August the 14th. A steady breeze from the northwest. We are moving fast, straight before the wind. There is a coast dimly visible to leeward. Nothing to be seen ahead. The extraordinary intensity of the light neither increases nor diminishes. The weather is remarkably fine. That is to say, the clouds have risen to a great height and are light and fleecy, floating in an atmosphere like molten silver. Temperature, 32 degrees centigrade. You think there are fish in this sea? No, Hans, definitely not. No? Oh, why do you think there are no fish? I think there might have been fish here once, just as there are animals on the seashores, but we saw no animals, only their fossil bones. Well, perhaps there are no fish, but perhaps also there are. We will see. Are you going to put a line down? Oh, yes. See, I have baited him with a little piece of meat, and now I throw him in. Wait and see. 
for a long time, we were disappointed. Then, at last, came a sudden hard tug on the line. Hans calmly pulled it in. So, lay our fish in this sea. Oh, yes. Oh, this splendid fish. Well done, Hans. It's a sturgeon, Uncle. Surely a small sturgeon. Hey, wait a moment, wait a moment. Give me time to perform my spectacles. So, now pass the fish to me, Hans. Dear me, how oh, he slept. Uh, mm, flat head, round body, bony scales, especially at the lower extremities. No teeth. Highly developed pectoral fins, no tail worth speaking of. No, 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 it is not a sturgeon, my dear boy. Not by any means. It belongs to a family which has been extinct for countless ages. There are remains of such a fish as this in the Devonian rocks. A fossil fish, Uncle? Is that what you mean? A a, a living fossil fish? Yes, yes. (laughs) To hold a living specimen such as this, to to hold it in one's hand is enough to make a, a naturalist happy for the rest of his life. It is of the order Ganoides, one of the family of Cephalospides of the genus Terechitis. But it is unique, even among fossils. Why unique? It is blind, my dear boy. Not only blind, but absolutely without organs of sight. Oh, Hans, go on fishing. I command you. See if you can catch more. Fish still more. Very good, master. I fish again. Hans baited the hook and threw it back into the sea. This subterranean ocean must have been tolerably well supplied with fish, for in two hours we took a great number of pterichites, as well as other fish belonging to another supposedly extinct family, the Depterides. All, without exception, were blind. These unexpected captures enabled us to renew our stock of provisions most satisfactorily. Having discovered these fossil fish, I began to wonder whether we should discover some of those huge reptiles regarded as extinct, but which scientists have reconstructed from bits of fossilized bones. I picked up the telescope and scanned the horizons. I examined every visible part of the sea. It was utterly and entirely deserted. I looked up at the strange and mysterious sky. It was as silent and as empty as the shores we had but lately left. Saturday, August 15th. The sea retains its uniform monotony. The same leaden hue. The same eternal glare from above. The horizon appears to retreat before us as we advance. There is no sign of land. The professor is in one of his morose and unaccountable humors. He spends his time scanning the horizon at every point of the compass, and when the telescope is not raised to his eye, he assumes a... Well, a Napoleonic attitude. Why? What has he to be angry or annoyed about? Wasn't our voyage progressing under the best of circumstances? Wasn't our humble raft speeding along faster than we had ever hoped? What, then, was troubling him? When for about the hundredth time he put down the telescope and paced morosely up and down, up and down... I ventured to ask if anything was wrong. Wrong? Why do you ask me if anything wrong? You seem uneasy, Uncle. I am not uneasy. By no means. But perhaps I should have said impatient. (laughs) It is enough to make any man impatient. I don't see why. I imagine not many rafts have moved faster than we're moving now. It's fabulous. So it is fabulous. So what does it matter if it's fabulous or not? It's not our speed, but the immensity of the sea which concerns me. It's so much bigger, so much wider, so much faster than I had expected. Ah, yes, you thought the sea was no more than 30 leagues across. Exactly. And already we must have covered, well, at least 90 or 100 leagues. But does it matter? Does it matter? You you ask me, does it matter? My boy, listen to me. We undertook a journey to the center of the earth, did we not? That is to say, we must descend. Descend all the time, descend, but we are not. Descending now. We are moving in a horizontal direction. We are not progressing. Oh, this is a a waste of time. I did not come here for a picnic. I tell you, this voyage on a raft across a pond irritates and wearies me. But, Uncle, if we are following the route indicated by Arne Sackison, 
We, we can't be very far wrong. <laughs> but that is the question, as your immortal Shakespeare puts it. Are we indeed following the route of the great Saknussem? Did he ever cross this vast central sea? I am beginning to fear that the Hansbach, the little stream we adopted for our guide, has led us astray. Well, what if it has? In any case, Uncle, we can't regret having come so far. It's worth all the hardships of our journey to enjoy this wonderful scenery. I care nothing about seeing wonderful scenery. I descended into the interior of the earth with one object, and that object I mean to attain. So please do not talk to me about admiring scenery or any other sentimental rubbish. After this outburst, I thought it was well to hold my tongue. Indeed, nobody spoke again until six o'clock in the evening when Hans said... Master, if you please. Well, Hans, uh, today I think is Saturday. Saturday? What does it matter whether it's Saturday, Sunday, or any other day? Well, it is important, Master. Today is Saturday, and on every Saturday you pay my wages. Oh, oh of course. I undertook to pay your wages every Saturday, no matter where we happen to be. Yes. Three rich dollars, Master. Here, here. One, two, three. Uh, it's correct. Uh, I thank you, Master. Thank you. Sunday, August the 16th. Nothing new to record. The wind shows a tendency to freshen, perhaps with signs of an approaching gale. When I awoke, my first observation was in regard to the intensity of the light. For I confess that I am seized with a secret fear that this extraordinary electric illumination will in some way become dimmed or obscured and then perhaps extinguished, leaving us in total darkness. Nothing of the kind, however, occurs. The shadow of the raft, the mast, and the sail are clear-cut on the surface of the water. This wonderful sea, it seems limitless in extent. It must surely be as wide as the Mediterranean, perhaps, perhaps as wide as the great Atlantic Ocean. On more than one occasion, Hans has tried deep-sea soundings. He tied the cross of one of our heaviest crowbars to the end of a cord, and this he allowed to run out to the extent of 200 fathoms. It did not touch bottom, and he had the greatest difficulty in pulling in the line. This morning he tried again. I went across to help him haul in. <laughs> Thank you. Good. He's coming in well now. Great. I will lift the crowbar onto the deck. Ah, there. Huh? Huh? What is it, Hans? These marks on the iron crowbar. You see? Yes. What are they? Thunder. Thunder? What do you mean by that? Uh, teeth. Yeah, teeth. There was no doubt about it. The indentations on the iron bar were the marks of teeth. What jaws? What strength? must the owner of such teeth possess? Had we disturbed a monster of some unknown species? A monster more voracious than a snake, more terrible and more massive than a, a whale? There was no means of telling. As on other Sundays, we observed today as a day of rest and meditation. But for my part, I could scarcely take my eyes from the mauled crowbar, or my mind from the terrifying speculations that it aroused. Monday, August 17th. I have been looking at the crowbar again, and truly I am terrified. Again and again I ask myself whether I am fated to face some gigantic reptile of ancient times, and again and again I answer, no. Doesn't seem possible. I just can't believe it. And yet these marks on the crowbar. Is there any doubt at all that they were made by the jaws of a monstrous crocodile? I fancy the professor in some measure shares my speculations, if not my fears. For after a close examination of the crowbar, he looked long and in all directions over this mighty and mysterious sea. What possessed him to leave the safe shelter of the land, I thought. And de determined to be prepared for the worst, I examined our weapons and made sure that they were ready for use. My uncle watched me and nodded his head approvingly. Do I... 
Imagine it. Or is there a movement? A swelling of the surface waters indicating that something is stirring far, far below. Tuesday, August the 18th. Today has passed with no incident worth recording. Now at last it is evening. We are drowsy and ready for sleep. There is no night, properly speaking, in these parts, any more than there is summer in the Arctic regions, as summer is generally understood. Hans remains immovable at the rudder. He must sleep, of course, but when he does, I can't say. This evening I dropped into a heavy sleep. Some two hours later... I was awakened suddenly by an immense shock. The raft seemed to be lifted completely out of the water. I take it, Frank. Are these shipwrecks? Look, master. I cannot make it out. The black mass is went up and down. A big research, master. Yes. A sea lizard of prodigious shape and size. And there, a whale. It is indeed a whale, Harry. Her great fins, and see how she blows air and water. Two columns of water rose to a vast height above the sea. We stood stuck still, stupefied at the sight of these fearful marine monsters. Hans seized the rudder which had flown from his grasp and put it hard to windward. But there, to leeward, was was a turtle about 40 feet wide and a serpent quite as long, thrusting its hideous head from the waters. Escape was impossible. The reptiles advanced on us, turning and twisting about the raft with fearful swiftness. Nearer and nearer they came, the mighty crocodile on one side, the serpent on the other. I snatched up my rifle in desperation and was about to try the effect of a bullet when Hans checked me. The monsters passed within a hundred paces of the raft, then made a frenzied rush one another. to me that the other monsters, the whale, the lizard, and the turtle had joined this fierce and deadly struggle. I pointed them out to Hans, but he shook his head. No, no, uh, I think it's best not to fire the gun, Master Harry. There are only two animals. Perhaps they do not see us. Only two? But Hans, all right. Hans is right, absolutely right. I can see clearly through the telescope. Note down what I tell you, Harry. The first monster has the snout of a porpoise, the teeth of, I will say, a crocodile, the head of a lizard. Such a description is apt to deceive us. I would say the most fearful of all antediluvian reptiles. An ichthyosaurus or great fish lizard. But the other? What about the other? A serpent. A monstrous serpent concealed, as it were, beneath the carapace of a turtle. A sea crocodile. The plesiosaurus. Yes, yes, I'm well aware of that. Quiet now. I wish to concentrate on this wonderful spectacle. The monsters attacked each other with inconceivable fury, raising mountains of water and showering us with spume. Time and again, we seemed on the point of being overturned. The combatants were joined together in a tight embrace so that I could scarcely distinguish one from the other. An hour passed. Two, three hours. Now the great beasts drew closer to the raft. Now they drew away. We crouched ready to fire instantly. Though I, for one, had no hopes we might wound them or scare them away. Suddenly, both monsters vanished under the waves. There was a mighty maelstrom in the midst of the sea which all but sucked us under. Ah, look, look. They come up again. Shall I shoot? No. Give me the telescope quickly. Ah, there are not two this time. There's only one. There's only the place you saw. Now I could see that the great sea crocodile was wounded unto death. I could see its serpent-like neck threshing and curling and twisting in the agonies of dying. Now it flailed the waters like a whip. Now it twisted like a worm sliced in two. In all directions, the water spurted to a great height, sweeping clean over the raft and blinding us. Soon it became clear that the end of the beast was at hand. Its movement slackened. Its contortions almost ceased. At length, the body lay inert on the now calm and placid waters. And I thought, so much for the plesiosaurus. But what about the victor? 
the ichthyosaurus. Has he gone down to some undersea cavern to rest and lick his wounds? Or will he reappear to destroy us? fifth installment of A Journey to the Centre of the Earth, adapted by Howard Jones from the novel by Jules Verne. The cast was as follows. Harry Lawson was played by Bernard Horsfall, Professor von Hartwig by Geoffrey Banks, and Hans Bjorke by John Daglish. It was produced in the north of England by Trevor Hill. You'll be able to hear the sixth installment of this serial at 5.25 next Thursday in Storytime on Radio 4, and that's called The Hurricane. <laughs>